Thank you, Dan. So how many people in the room have been to the last two MedTech Mondays and the Women in MedTech panel? Okay, so a handful. So yeah, this is, I'm gonna stand. Um, this is the third MedTech panel, as Dan said, and I thought to just kind of set the context. Um, the first MedTech panel, the consensus on the panel was that, you know, we're really people in MedTech, and do we, it's sad that we have to have kind of a women in MedTech panel, so let's talk about the business and our perspective and our experience and that kind of thing. Well, in January, the environment kind of changed with the Me Too and Harvey Weinstein and all of that. So we did actually address that topic, um, which was interesting at the time. But I think the consensus on this panel is, you know, that was then, this is now. And so we'll touch a little bit about the, the women aspect of being in med tech, and then we're going to get into um, one of the um, industry issues, so to speak, and, um, and get their perspective on that. So with that, I'm going to go down the line if you could just introduce yourself and let us know how you got to be where you are today. Why am I holding this? I might. Yeah. <laughs> now I have two. Um, there you go. So my name is Janet Whipple and I actually come from an in vitro diagnostics background. I started with Beckman Instruments when it was really a California based company and Dr. Beckman was still running the company or still involved with the company. And, and from there it expanded and through many mergers and acquisitions and the like, it became Beckman Coulter. And, and I was actually with Beckman Coulter for a total of 23 years, after which I began consulting. And, and so since then I have been consulting in quality systems, in in vitro diagnostics, in combination products, um, as well as pharmaceuticals and med device, um, building quality systems and helping with um, acquisitions as well as divestitures and rebranding. I'm Grace Fu Palmer. I grew up in Beijing. Uh, I did an earlier talk on uh, the turnkey solution for China. So uh, in terms of my background, uh, when I was growing up, there was nothing. Music was banned, there was the Cultural Revolution, uh, Mao was in power, and then Nixon came, that opened up the whole world. Nixon, uh, believe it or not, at least he, uh, he opened up China, helped that way. So things, and then I got a chance to come to this country, uh, got my degree, and I joined Hewlett Packard Medical, uh, spent quite a few years there, did their joint venture with China. That was in the mid-90s. Back then, we had to import a cable for an ultrasound system. We had to import it from Singapore. So my career has been really taking the tremendous opportunity that China developed. So uh, I got the opportunity to work uh, in addition to the big companies. And then I joined uh, the smaller companies, the startup companies. I was their uh, global head of uh, marketing and sales and trying to, uh, this US company, trying to uh, bring their product globally, especially back to uh, China. Uh, and I started uh, my own company uh, six years ago, and now we merged with another company. So uh, I think uh, I remember when I was a little kid, career-wise, I just remember one thing. My mother said, uh, women can hold up half of the sky, let men hold up the other half. So I've always tried at least to hold up my half. <laughs> oh, hi, I'm Suzanne Williams um, from Mobius Medical in Sydney. Um, I majored in microbiology and soon after that realized I was a horrible scientist. I was working in a wound healing research institute dealing with necrosed pig tissue all day and thought, no, this is not why I just went to university. Um, and one of our products was going into clinical. And so I decided that might have been a better option for me. And uh, my first job was with Icon back when it was in three countries, uh, Germany, the UK, and here in Philadelphia. And it's now, I think, in 43 countries. <coughs> Amazing success. So Icon took me to Chicago as a secondment. Uh, five of us went for 12 months. And from Chicago, I ended up opening the Sydney office, um, which is where I stayed for one year. And as I said earlier, I've been there for 19. Uh, from there, I worked in Big Pharma and went through um, acquisitions from Searle, which is a company that invented Celebrex. Um, eventually was taken up by Pharmacia and then Pfizer, so I experienced that um, journey. Uh, from there, I decided medical devices was my thing and started consulting to the industry 
on, on my own um, and then founded Mobius Medical uh, just under 10 years ago. We're going to be 10 in October, which we're quite excited about. Only, uh, I think, 1% to 3% of companies in Australia make 10 years small businesses. So we're, we're chuffed. <coughs> I think that's it. Excellent. Mike. Can you all hear me? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, so this issue of, of women in med tech, um, you know, we talked a little bit in, in preparation about, about the issue and, you know, we are sort of, I guess, underrepresented if you look at the industry as a whole. Um, and I think there have been um, efforts at certain companies to increase the diversity and things like that. Um, you know, what's your perspective on the issue? Um, how are you handling that at your companies? I'm not sure I can, I can speak to it personally from my company, but I can say what I've, I've seen on both sides is there, there are sometimes a propensity to overcompensate, and, and, and so you go after um, women because they're women. And, and I will tell you that um, right out of college, I had that experience in that I'm a, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I graduated at a time when there were only two women in my graduating class of 100. And um, I was interviewing with uh, ExxonMobil, and I was offered a job as a senior manager right out of college. And um, come to find out that the reason that I was offered this job was not because I was necessarily the most qualified, but because, in fact, I was the most qualified woman. And the men that I would be managing had been in the company for quite a number of years. Well, realizing that I wasn't going to be set up for success, I gratefully declined the offer and, and went elsewhere. So I have seen in some cases where we can overcompensate in trying to go after women when that may or may not necessarily be the appropriate thing to do. And so what I, my motto is, go after the best qualified candidate, regardless of what color they are, what nationality, what race, what anything, uh, male, female, find your best qualified candidates. I think to me, since I'm, I grew up in China, it's uh, first in this country, it's, it's the cross-cultural, cross I learned a lot about that, is being foreigner in the US, that's <coughs> obstacle number one. And then being Asian, that's obstacle number two. And then being female, that's obstacle number three. So all these three areas throughout my career, I've experienced you know, different uh, uh, obstacles, but I think the key is always take the attitude of everything is mutual. So I remember when I first started at Hewlett Packard Diversity. So Hewlett Packard Medical, we have this diversity training and uh, we have this Harvard speaker talking about diversity. So at the end, uh, the management was very keen on the quota, the female, the minority. So I, I, I went up, I said, you know, you guys were talking about, I, with the culture where it came from. I said, in the hallway, I greet you. I said, you know, I said, hi, have you, ha, have you eaten yet? That's a common Chinese way of greeting. You know, I just graduated from school and joined Hewlett Packard. I can't tell the white guys, you know, the same thing. Like, you probably get discriminated and you tell, you can't tell me apart. I, I, told, I call Steve Joe or Joe Steve. I mean, I, 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 the same thing. So, um, so I, you know, in that diversity, I said, you know, I said, I said, hello, have you eaten yet? Nobody responded. Everybody was just busy going through the hallway. I said, you know, that's, that's a, a way for a Chinese of a greeting. I said, that's part of, it should be part of the diversity culture as well. I think it's, it's the reciprocal of understanding each other, how we communicate, the common language. I think it, it, no matter what we do, it, it doesn't matter whatever you are, it's the communication. I think that's, that's always uh, uh, usually I find it uh, helped me over the hump, but mm -hmm. definitely all the three obstacles I've experienced them multiple times. <laughs> I think uh, I've got the sort of opposite problem in, in clinical research, especially in contract research organizations, it's about 80% female. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm not sure that's such a good thing. Um, I think that it's just all about balance. And again, somebody said to me the other day, you know, if you had to have 
six people on your board, would you want three of each gender? And I said, no, I'd want the best six. <laughs> you know? So I think my opinion is, I think the pendulum has swung a little bit too far, the opposite way to you know, what we've historically seen um, over certainly all of our lives and our ancestors in that the, you know, equality was certainly um, not apparent. And I think now it's going a little bit too far the other way in that you said, you know, they hired you because you're female. We can't have that. <laughs> we can't have that in industry and we can't have that in life. So, but I am hopeful that it's just an evolutionary thing and that the pendulum eventually will just settle, you know. I'm an optimist. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we wanted to move on to a different topic that's kind of hot in the industry right now. We just heard that there's a lot of money flowing. Uh, we were at a trillion dollar of M&A at this point in the year, expected another trillion, I think was the statistic. Um, and how many of you in the audience have been involved in M&A in some way, whether you were the purchaser or the, the purchasee? Okay, so pretty good portion, which was what I expected. Um, so I myself have been involved in an M&A. Before I started my business 12 years ago, I worked for an agency that was bought by Porter Novelli. Um, they're owned by Omnicom, so a big company. And there was a four-year earnout. The owners got in a fight in the first five months, and it was like I told my husband, it was like rubbing sandpaper on my body, going to work every day. Ugh. And uh, at the end of it, all the talent was gone, and the people who orchestrated the acquisition were fired. But it was just basically a culture clash, fighting, you know, that kind of thing. And then, on the business side, you know, we work with clients in med tech and other areas, healthcare startups, on up to big companies. And a lot of the startups, obviously, their exit strategy oftentimes is get bought by one of those strategics, right? So we've seen that also, where there's hyper innovation in this little small company and they're just moving and shaking and then they get like assimilated by the Borg, for you Star Trek fans. Um, and it's just a culture clash. And um, the two instances that I'm thinking of, you know, all the executives left at the appointed time. So it's just, it happens and I just feel like personally, um, you know, the culture aspect is not addressed very well, at least in my experience. So I asked the ladies about that and um, uh, Janet in particular, I think you've been through how many acquisitions? 17 did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you're involved in all kinds of strategic partnerships and, and you've been through some M&A you said. And, um, so I thought maybe we'd talk about that topic a little bit because um, how many have been through painful M&A or how many have been through successful M&A, let me ask that. Like, from a, if you get what I'm saying. Okay. So there is a need, I think. So let's talk about, um, you know, sort of best practices or, or challenges. I mean, maybe you can tell some stories about how, what, it, what it was like to go from, what was it, one million to one billion? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there are really two key indicators that you can tell early on if an M&A is going to go well. And the first one is, is there a plan? Because very often what you'll see is that an integration plan is on some Excel spreadsheet somewhere, or maybe not at all. And, and so is there a plan that's well articulated? And, and then the second piece is what, is, what is the purpose of the integration? What you'll see is there, there really are two types. There's the one where we own you and I'm going to make a place for me and all my friends. And then there's the type that is, I'm going to go in and I'm going to de determine what are the best practices. I want to make sure that if I am buying a startup company, that I am going to retain the knowledge of this startup company. And I want to do what's in the best interest of retaining the technology that's there, not, OK, I own it, now it's mine. And so you can tell from the very beginning, if those two things are in place, that it's more likely to go well. Uh, I think the uh, it, the merge and acquisition, there are multiple ways. For big companies, I was with Hewlett Packard, and then Philips came in, acquired four different uh, imaging modalities, became, you know, imaging, they acquired Hewlett Packard for ultrasound, uh, uh, AED, and then they acquired uh, um, ADAX for, uh, for nuclear. So in, in, if you look at these big companies acquiring another big company, so that's for strategic reason, and I remember during the integration phase, I left right after, during the integration phase, there's more of a mutual, because big company cultural, big company cultural, it's more of a cultural fit afterwards. 
the pretty much the rest are left alone. Like Hewlett Packard culture is terminal niceness, if you don't know. <laughs> uh, Philips culture is, if you are I'm not being mean, if you're not Dutch, you don't mean much, that's what we say. <laughs> uh, that's the, uh, and, and that's big company. And then uh, also when we were at Hewlett Packard, we had a heart stream, which is AED portable. You see AED everywhere. Back then, it wasn't that popular. So the big company acquired it. They left it alone in Seattle. They didn't move it over because so that to retain the innovation is, is there. And on the partnership side, like for a lot of the startups, a few million dollars is big money now, especially for medtech, because med all the money is going to biotech in Cambridge. The medtech is suffering in terms of fundraising. However, that's the opposite in China. Chinese, they don't want, uh, the biotech is hot in China, but they don't want to drug. Drug is too long for Chinese investors. So they, they love medtech, medical device. They think they can touch it, feel it, and it's shorter. So for these companies, we try to, we did a couple of partnership. We, so like one company recently we did, it was, um, they had a prototype for a portable MRI. Uh, so we helped them with $4 million with a strategic uh, company. So the structure is important when you deal this cross-border is figure out, you know, what's important to you? What, what are you willing to give? So the way we structured is, okay, the technology and the core piece of it remain in the U.S. The China partner, the corporation, have the option to own the distribution, but they still have to meet certain milestones in addition to you know certain percentage of the equity. That was that wasn't a, you know majority equity investment. So there, each situation is is different. I mean, I agree. Objective is clear. You know, what is the seller want? What is the buyer want? And figure out you know if there's mutual compatibilities and if, when you're dealing with cross-border you got to think about all the other factors as well I think um, I won't add anything else to M&A's that I've been through um, that you, you've said that but from a contract house uh, such as mine it's, it's very interesting when we work with a startup company who is acquired um, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we don't get paid oh. <laughs> by the billion dollar company yeah, um, and they force <laughs> us into recontracting into 90 day net payment. So for a company of my size, you know, it's, it's, it's crippling. I mean, aside from just the operational side of things where suddenly it's extremely difficult to get anything done, to get any decision made, to get things signed off in a, in a timely enough fashion so that we can do our job effectively on the ground in Australia and keep that clinical trial going, there's just cogs that are being halted left and right the second that that M&A um, has gone through. And I'm sure it will, we, we've just been through two, and I'm sure it will even out it, mm -hmm. over time, again, the optimist. Um, but the whole payment thing is just <coughs> extremely frustrating, mind-boggling how, you know, <laughs> they just think that's absolutely fine to not pay their bills. I was still owed $4,000 uh, from AMO, which then became what was it, Abbott? No, Abbott, and then became J&J. &J. Yeah, good luck getting that back. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly. Um, so, again, you've been through 17, and you, you've given us, okay, there's two kinds, and you've got to figure out which kind. Can you talk about, just give us any vignettes of, like, examples of when it's worked, when it's worked well? Because I think part of it is, is not only that you have a strategy, but that you actually execute it and you communicate because you're not, it's not just like the leadership that the whole organization has to come along, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, once again, it really does come down to when you're looking out at the best interest of the company and, and go after grabbing what are the best practices because very often what happens is it's a, a larger company that's mm -hmm. buying a smaller company and the larger companies tend to move a little bit slower, not be quite as innovative, have a little bit more bureaucracy, because it's very easy to build complexity. It's not so easy to build simplicity into processes. And so if you actually look at a lot of the startup companies that I've had the privilege of working with, they, they tend to be a lot more lean by necessity, um, and therefore processes are not near as complex. And I believe there are great opportunities for the larger companies that are acquiring these to actually stop and take a moment and learn from those companies that they are purchasing. 
And in those instances, um, those are the, the best marriages, truly. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Do you have anything to add, Grace, or? Um, I don't think I do. Um, it, I, I suppose of the two M&As that I've just been through from the receiving end as the contractor, one did appear to go an awful lot smoother and, and as a result for us the transition was quite seamless and the, and the other one didn't. I mean not being in those companies is a bit difficult for me to, to comment but um, I think it, it was the sheer size of a, the initial company, the smaller fish, um, and whether one of those companies was a, like an eight-person company and the other one was maybe a 58-person company. Mm -hmm. um, and so things sort of moved a little bit quicker with the eight-person company. They just basically got swallowed up, mm -hmm. you know, and that was the end of that. Whereas the other one, it took six to nine months for that transition to actually happen where... We had a team to work with, my group's got a team to work with in their group that has suddenly started falling off. So those people, the original guys that were in the startup, are all starting to leave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now all of a sudden, big company is ruling the roost. Um, they don't really have a vested interest or a passion in that technology and that's a real shame, I think, from, you know, from my perspective. Interesting. That was relevant. I have a question for the audience. Has anyone in here been a part of the Medtronic Covidian merger? Because I would love to be a fly on the wall for that integration strategy. Um, so I think probably now uh, we've got a couple of minutes. I'd like to just throw it over to the audience if you'd like to ask some questions for the panel. Anyone? Bring the mic over. Hi, thank you ladies. I'm Elle Hamilton with Cineos Health. I'm also the head of the Healthcare Businesswomen's Association here in Orange County. So really very relevant to hear you all and thank you for sharing. Um, when I heard you all talking about though that the pendulum has swung too much to the other side, it did get me addressing the issue a little bit deeper in that the companies that we talk to who are the Medtronics of the world who are all the way in you know, the big pharma, two smaller companies, are approaching it differently. They're not setting quotas. We must have X amount of women in a certain place. But instead, what they're doing is they're looking at some of the roadblocks and trying to create an equal path for everyone in terms of upward mobility. Are we supporting our people so that they have the opportunities to become a director, a VP, and looking at, okay, maybe we haven't Give, spread the opportunities across to women as much as we should. So what is your perspective from your careers if you have seen professional development applied to women appropriately? I'll start real quick because, uh, like I said, in my industry, we're, we're so heavily female focused that um, I don't see any in inequality there in terms of opportunities and professional development, etc., within clinical research. If anything, we're trying to encourage more men to come into the industry. Um, so, yeah, that's all I've really got. Uh, when I was working at the big company, uh, f uh, like Philips Hewlett Packard, the upward mobility, there's the glass ceiling there. Uh, I remember it, it's like the upper management, most of them are um, a, f a male, but we do have a, a, fe a feel. A female, like uh, in, I was in the ultrasound group. Our general manager was from Siemens. She's a, a female engineer. So I think it's important if you're a female to find the company where you can find these uh, executive uh, VPs that are female, and then uh, start the uh, mentoring program. And I was lucky enough to to be part of the mentee program. So I got lucky to have the one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the, uh, the, the executive VP and she would say, you know, I, I look like a MM Mars. I'm, a hard, I'm like a hard shell on the outside, but inside of me is my old mushy chocolate. <laughs> uh, so so it's, it's like, um, I, I think 
you know, for women, uh, definitely if we know how to communicate, find the role model, I think definitely that you can you can move, especially in the in the in this past uh, ten years environment. I think it's more encouraging than before. I don't really have anything to add. I have a daughter who recently graduated college and just started in the med tech industry. What advice would you have for someone who is a woman, who is a new grad, based on your experience for her future? Gosh, I, I, I would say, and, and, and I'm, I, again, I'm not necessarily gonna direct this towards women, uh, but in general, for anyone, I would say pursue your passion. Um, because going, you spend actually more time at work than you do with your family when you, when you look at the bigger picture. Um, and, and you often spend more time with your coworkers than you do with your family. And so I think it's really important to love what you do because you don't have to go to work when you're loving what you do. I, I totally agree. I have uh, uh, two girls. Uh, I, follow, follow, follow your heart, and then also I think be uh, also uh, realistic. You know, I run my own company now. I need to hire salespeople, so I'm biased. So when I hire salespeople, business development people, first I look at: is she pretty? Is she female? You know, that's that's kind of stereotype biased, but sometimes it's still, unfortunately, in this world, it's still. Uh, uh, helps. Uh, so really, I think it depending um, on what what she's after, and then find a role that's fit her personality, fit her passion. Uh, my older daughter, she can smell trouble a mile away. My younger one is a tomboy. She, like the trouble is right in front of her face. She wouldn't be able to tell. <laughs> so you know, for that. My younger one, I tell her, you'll probably be better for engineering scientists where you don't have to deal with a lot of people. <laughs> so, <laughs> really, it, it depends, I think. <laughs> I just think harness your skill set. You know, I don't think it really, hopefully it doesn't matter too much what gender you are. I think it's all about your skill set. And some women have a fantastic feminine, soft skill set around them, but some don't. <laughs> you know, there's plenty of women who are as strong, as analytical, um, as narrow-minded, you know, as they can be. But I would also say, don't be a ball breaker. You know, that would be my advice if I did have a daughter. I don't, I've got a son, so maybe that's a good thing. But just be a woman. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell. I'm a professional sales trainer to many Fortune 500 companies, and I should know everything about persuasion, influence, etc. But I have a 17, now 18-year-old daughter, and my question is not just from the... At 17 years old, she was promoted to the assistant manager of the restaurant where she works. She's extremely capable, just a wonderful young lady, and of course, bossing around older men, older women, and she's very good at that. But still, she comes home with friction issues, et cetera. And so not just from the standpoint of how do you, because there's ego involved, how do you deal with, with managing and leading, not just managing, but leading men, especially older men, but then also, I mean, Janet, for instance, you, you turned down a, a position, probably wisely so at that time, but my, my question for all three of you then is not just uh, leading men, but also leading people that are older, more experienced, and have more expertise, and therefore have tremendous egos at stake. Um, I'll, I'll start real quick. So I deal with surgeons on a daily basis. They're my <laughs> customer. Um, and I would say 99% of them are extremely humble, gracious, and wonderful people to work with. And then you do get the 1% who do think they are above you and godly, and I remind them that they are the surgeon, but they don't have a clue as to what I do, and what I do is ensure that the company's clinical data 
is rigorous and robust and gets the product that they're using in their hand to market so that they can actually use it. And that kind of just puts everything into perspective. I think it's important that they know what they do, but there's also a level of respect for what we do, whether it's me as a female or me as a 24-year-old, you know, because when you're a clinical research associate, you're flung into dealing with these people um, on your own, sometimes out of college with a science degree, not even at skerrick of medical knowledge to your name. Um, and you've got to have a level of confidence about, I do not know what you do, you know. I do not know how you stand there for 11 hours in one spot with your hands inside a person's chest. But you haven't got a clue what I do either. <laughs> so. Um, to expand a little on, on what um, Susan had to say is, uh, I would advise keep it real. So understand that she's only going to succeed if her people succeed, and so she needs to acknowledge their strengths and abilities, and at the same time be able to say, these are my strengths and abilities, and, and so to the, to the point that you can communicate and be humble about we're in it together, and, and recognize, hey, look, I, I'm young. I understand I'm young, I'm new, teach me. And likewise, I'm in a position of power and I've done this on my own and here I am. So you need to respect me as well. I think in the uh, hierarchical relationship, the subordinate usually, whether it's male or female, you're, you're in this power position. So whatever you say, it tend to be over interpreted. Uh, so, what I find is that was when I was become the department manager, everybody was older, almost twice the, my age. So I was dealing with this group of both men and women twice my age it, in, the, in the culture where I can't tell Joe and John. So that was, you know, that was very challenging. Uh, what, what I learned is to be respectful of them and don't, don't tell them what to do, but try, there's so many leadership models and team building kind of coaches and tools. So what I would do is, you know, gather your team, hire an outside person to analyze the dynamics, the team dynamics of, of who you are, have this consultant do it so that, you know, you, it's not from you is from a third party with this, this model. I, I find that kind of excise more rounded up together for all of us, and we understood our decision-making process. We understand more about our, you know, that was like an offsite two-day thing we did, and I was in a big company, so <laughs> we can afford. But for smaller companies, I can't, you know, we don't do that type of excise anymore. So now I rely on Zodiac sign. So when I hire somebody, <laughs> I look at their zodiac sign. I look at my team. That's, that's the quickest way. So my team, what zodiac sign I have, and then you know what is the next harmony I'm trying to achieve. Well, ladies, thank you very much. That was fantastic.